Thank you. I hope you had a chance to stretch for a little bit. I was um, thinking on sitting there, but it's also nice to stand up, so you can also stand up if you like. <laughs> Much nicer as well. Um, well, what I wanted to, to say, or what I can say, is um, it's coming from the specific place and moment we are now. And I think it is really very uh, uh, inspiring and I think important that there is this seminar happening here in an art academy. Uh, as you can see, the question of how do we relate from our practice with the ecological uh, crisis at this point and also ecological concern in a broader sense apart from the specific moment we are living. As you can see it's not such a, a easy um, promenade no? and, and a nice place to grow through in terms that in this moment this uh, roadmap we are defining and that was also very uh, well illustrated by uh, Caroline point no, on the different perspectives on, on ecology that are uh, coming together. It's actually a, a, well, a, 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 let's say a, a forest of different references no, that we have to walk through. And I think that it's also related with the position of every, 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 every each of us no, and how do we relate to this question. I think that also uh, Vincian's um, stake on how, as a scientist, no, or trained as a scientist with this uh, uh, background, no, I start to work for, within a new paradigm in which the, it's making very clear no, the, the, all the notions that we have inherited of the researcher are completely isolated from the uh, object that is research is actually reversed, and the, research, the observer becomes objectified somehow or um, uh, transcends no, the very specific uh, situation that it departs from. Um, the question could be also how do we position ourselves as artists or as cultural workers or practitioners within this current debate? And I think it's very uh, well enriching that we can pose this question now, even when you are studying no, about this whole art field and uh, potential way of living or profession or both. And I remember when I can, can I have some slides? So, so. when I was uh, at, at the university, um, I, uh, I uh, in my second year or something, I started to create a, or try to create an association. And I remember it was uh, having this a little bit crappy poster. So something has evolved as well within time. It's a, probably a more interesting design as we have seen in, in this other seminar. But I remember that it was based also in a, in, a, in a little poem by William Blake. In this case, the point of departure is the, is the, the figure of Walt Whitman. And I personally f believe that both of them, you know, uh, Whitman and Blake, are somehow um, seeds of what is an uh, enlarged um, engagement and involvement of the artist and the cultural practitioner within the current uh, and, the, and the previous you know, uh, impact of the human species in the biosphere. What I mean is that we are not really discovering, as we can say, discovering a, a merit in a glass of water. No? We are not just uh, uh, being uh, pioneers in this. But actually, very often is, uh, 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 for me, uh, intercross of times and moments. And the questions that will rise at those different times are still present nowadays. And then we, maybe we have to confront them again from different perspectives. And so it's a, a kind of game of mirror somehow. For example, when we think in those early romantics that were reacting against the first effects of industrial revolution and technification of life and the expansion of the understanding of, uh, of, of the world and the relation with the world and nature no, by by the capitalist uh, uh, utopy, uh, the reaction was um, 
at some point leading, for example, to the case of the Lace District in the United Kingdom, where Ruskin and Wordsworth and other romantic poets started to buy farmland to preserve it from, uh, from let's say, its uh, uh, destruction no? by the by the at that time uh, very very um, aggressive industrial capitalism that the United Kingdom was living, and that now is less visible here in Europe because of our later stage in that progress. But um, I'll try not to, to be long, launching a lot of rhetorical questions, and I often I, I do. And it's strange also because instead of, I mean, uh, responding to the answer we depart from, no? or the, 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 form, the formula of question that this seminar is, is, is taking as a departing point, um, instead of having a, a certain response, all right, Maybe we, we have to keep asking questions. And it would be nice to be able to start from a, from a certainty. I was thinking both in biographical and in more general social terms. What I mean is that at some point uh, where we are now, it's coming from the uh, evidence of the certainty that happened in 73 when uh, Midos at the MIT no? uh, managed to uh, let's say made a, a projection. No? So it's a kind of also uh, contradictory um, position by which no, the, 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 we invoke the future through the system dynamics and the first cybernetics that were able to compute ev um, evolution of models. We invoke the future through te the technology and we use that technology and that early computer technology as a way to a point at the menace that the technological or the industrial uh, uh, production model was having in the world. I don't know if I made the point, but what it means that uh, we, ha we, are, we, we arrived to use a para-thinking tool that was the first computers, that was looking forward into the future and saying that with this very uh, um, rudimentary language of letters, the first inform infographs, saying that, well, going like we are going, we go nowhere. And yeah, well, this was the way to, within the very established and solid uh, uh, system of belief of uh, industrial capitalism of the 70s, was the only way to point out, hey, let's wait for a second, there might be limits to growth. It was the, the name for the book that actually was funded by the Club of Rome, very, inter very exchange, a very strange uh, mixture of economical agents and so on. And that uh, kind of certainty that was anchored in the, in the, in the, in the, well, in the uh, undiscussable and or, or um, um, true word of a computer. Um, give rise also to a, what has been the ecologist movement you know, in the last 30 years. So the moment we are now is also part of that succession of events that we have to be very, very aware about and how do we relate with them. And I'm taking this uh, point of reference, but we could be talking of, I don't know, as we said, uh, William Blake or, or, or Whitman. No? And um, that certainty it's, uh, it's uh, something also that I thought I had. I, I grew up in, a, in an abandoned village in the north of Spain, and I don't know. When I was at uh, university, I realized that there was something really uh, a strange missing, a big gap within contemporary culture that was so far about the realities I lived. Uh, and I think that the contact with uh, with nature uh, was for me like the source for any further action. So I was thinking that every artist should be by nature and for nature, if you understand what I mean. Uh, that with the years looked a little bit naive in many senses. First of all, because what is this contact with nature and what is actually living in a place with, uh, let's say, low density of uh, human impact? No? 
um, I think it's some kind of um, understanding of a, of a essential uh, of a of a not very easy to explain um, complex harmony that we can see within the mountains and the forest, and also that is not only the aesthetic beauty, but also is the multisensorial uh, 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 apprehension no, of that phenomenon. We walk through a forest in different times of the year, and you start to understand not only by seeing, but of course with all the senses, how it evolves in the different seasons, in the wetness of the winter, where the mosses are more present, and the, the different also start to see how the animals uh, 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 have their cycles within this broader cycle and so on. But this very um, uh, specific category that is related with the pleasurable of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, as I said, a feeling of multisensorial uh, uh, harmony, as we can see, is also very contested. Uh, in the previous days, we saw, for example, the last shot, so the last sequence of the radiant, no? This kind of uh, 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 clear in the woods, or even, even not so clear, that could be the place where the romantic artist no, just tried to frame and define as, look at here, it's not everything about cotton machines and accumulating money to have big villas and landscape gardens that simulate pastoral landscape that we already are losing. But it's also about just understanding other ways, no? And then the different aesthetical categories, as I said, Victor is just sublime and so on. And it's also contested with the other new approaches that uh, new materialism and the other ecosophies are also bringing. And it is to say as well that it's not only a aesthetic category, and it's not only a, a, a scientific uh, fact that we discovered through the early cybernetics. That there are, that our society is, uh, let's say, at some point, is just a matter of of growth. A society that has been developed with certain uh, what what ecologists call endosomatic uh, ways of consumption of resources and deposing of waste, is at some point not uh, really a compass with the capacity of the ecosystem, natural and biological and and, uh, and bio, 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 uh, biological. Oh, yeah. Well, endosomatic is the, uh, maybe Vincian can explain a little bit better what is endosomatic, but it's, let's say, the, the, what we need as a species to live. So, for example, let's say that a lynx has an endosomatic need of rabbits and the space that is related with the survival of the species, but in case of the human species, is uh, is going beyond the uh, organic real need of, for example, eating. So we, just, we don't just live any longer as animals with an endosomatic consumption, but we need maybe a house by the seaside, another in the city, plus a couple of cars. You know what I mean? It's the, 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 consumption, the level of, of requirement of, um, of use of resources and the, and the, and the and interaction with the flows of matter and energy. Um, what I mean is that this question is not only a scientific question, uh, nor it will be solved by means of scientific reaction, but it's essentially also nowadays also a, a, a political and a, a, a question. What I mean is that, for example, when we uh, uh, criticize or when we um, are concerned about the impact of the applied synthetic chemicals to food production, and we pose as a solution the turn into organic farming, that could be completely a feasible um, uh, state, democracy, capitalistic system uh, efficiently working with uh, eco green economies. It's completely feasible. And uh, actually, the, the strawberries we get from intensive uh, monoculture strawberry greenhouses with semi slave Mexican workforce or labor force is, is, has the perfect label of being organic. So it goes a little bit beyond this uh, um, uh, framework of, of, uh, of, uh, of um, physical or, or natural sciences 
concerns. No? And I think that um, this is uh, now um, evolving to a, a, well, a very interesting moment in which uh, the question is also how do we um, position ourselves regarding land no? and, uh, and land as surface. I, I had a diversity of notes and I don't want to um, go from question to question, but um, I think that what the, the pastoral meant and the, the friends from the day before were introducing, no? the question of the, uh, let's say, the privileged vision on a certain status quo that we would like to maintain by keeping people doing it, uh, and that was the origin of the of the, of the pastoral genre, for example, in the Baroque, and later somehow even continued through the proto-socialism of the Romantic era, um, is now taken as a tool by the communities itself that are feeling uh, directly, um, let's say, uh, 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 removed by this expansion of this notion of uh, of, uh, of use of land and resources. And I mean that somehow they are giving voice to what other communities couldn't articulate, like for example, plants and animals. I was thinking in this, for example, case. Um, this motto that the German movement of shepherds, and it's shared by the European Shepherds Network, we fliegen die Landschaft, die sie lieben. We care the landscape you love. It's actually uh, a step further into the, let's say, um, um, neopastoral or the counter, uh, counter maneuver of using what has been extended as a, as a, as a, as a asset that is an aesthetic landscape we look at and we enjoy, and we living in cities like to have to know that it's there because it's a feeling of something is going well. It's a, home or a paradise we could return at at some point. Uh, that utopian space we look at, but maybe we are not about to inhabit. But uh, it's actually saying uh, it's not just because an artist painted. It's because somebody molded it and it has an author. And this author is a shepherd. I find it interesting because it's a process of, let's say, empowerment and uh, self-attributing uh, uh, values no? and, uh, and uh, uh, legitima legitimation that is the first step for a further expansion of a point of view or a way of living. But it means that um, the, 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 the understanding of the last small food producers, shepherds, and peasants that are like the indigenous peoples, the very last remains of this huge project of expansion of the industrial technified capitalism. Uh, the last remains that are no longer uh, fulfilling the need of giving us food, because more or less what European Union, for example, is saying, we don't need you to produce food any longer. We rely on the machines for the food. So what they are saying is we are at the end cultural agents. We are at the end no longer or not only food producers but also cultural agents. And I want to say that this is for me a very clear a tactic a step. It's not to say I refuse to be a food producer, I refuse to manage the natural resources and to occupy land and to stay in the land and to actually be a kind of obstacle in the, in, the, in the expansion of the use of land by uh, prevalent uh, corporate economic actors. It's not only that I just want to make cultural landscape, but they say this tactic to build a bridge with society and then use culture and art as a way to defend the position and later uh, uh, move forward. So this is what I'm trying to pay attention at and, and following and taking part at. And this was the uh, action that happened in 2010. 
And even the, the, the origin of it was interesting because we were having the first meetings of the European Shepherds of Network and there were some conservationists coming from the side of the ecology of the animals. The ornithology was one of the first uh, roots of uh, environmentalism as we know it, you know, the lovers of birds, the lovers of insects. But in this case, uh, the conservationist was saying, well, we need shepherds because now we are realizing that some specific uh, natural species rely very much in this, what they call high value natural or traditional farming management systems. Uh, and as far as, for example, we don't have any more uh, shepherd uh, going to the mountains and leaving uh, the sheep around with some casualties, there will, no, there will be no uh, uh, Gipaetus, uh, bird vulture, or what do you call it? The, uh, well, it's a specific kind of vulture that only eats the inner side of the legs, bones of a small ruminants like sheep. So the last year, the LIFE project devoted 3 million euros to the recovering of the species, and a big uh, environmental NGO got the, got the money. And, and, and it's, well, having a lot of leaflets with a lot of shepherd's pictures. Uh, not now the shepherds are saying, we are here, and we are going to see what are the tactics the cultural tactics we can use to make us visible. To be probably a gay, queer, AIDS, ill artist in the New York of the early 60s was not easy. But it changed with time. To be a graffiti maker in the Valier of Paris was not really an easy way of living. But it changed and now we have graffiti in the Tate Modern. So the question of not only which flags we have and we take, but also from where do we hang these flags? It's also important. Uh, position and recognition. Um, let's uh, think then where we are, you know? Because we're asking Walt Whitman, we should ask ourselves as well. Well, As we saw, there are different understanding of ecologies. Um, and I think this is important because uh, this is another debate that happened. No? Mm. From where do we understand the environment as such and do we position ourselves to protect it? And it's related maybe with the, with the, with the very constructive discussion or polemic that uh, Caroline was bringing between this apparent opposition uh, of uh, Vandana, Shiva, and uh, and uh, Donna Haraway, although I have still my personal points on that. Um, but apart from some, uh, let's say, a little bit uh, techno, techno uh, yes, um, technolatric, technolatric uh, adoration of technology will save uh, mankind. I think that um, if we go at the roots of ecofeminism, we go to the Chipko movement of women who were, and Tasmandana uh, Shiva was also inspired by the uh, Narmada Project Dam uh, uh, in India in the, in the early 90s. The Chipko movement of women was a, a, what is called Adivasi, a, a indigenous peoples in India, and uh, they were living in a certain common land with grass and forest. The project of creating a big dam there actually made them to react. And then the very simple way to protest was to embrace trees. You know? So just hugging trees and trying to stay there as much as possible. This is now later more uh, uh, a familiar uh, way of, uh, let's say, uh, civil resistance. But very much we are getting into the world of the so defined biopolitics. No? The body as uh, the last uh, space of political defense, and in this case of a way of living that involves uh, having the, so the capacity of managing resources. And it also reminds me the other ecologies that uh, is not related with, the, uh, with just the problems of pollution or how to uh, have more green economies, but also with the questioning of the left discourse. The left discourse and the Marxist discourse that was applied was saying that we should go through a capitalist stage to later move into a, a, a moment of liberation through socialism. 
and actually said that the liberation will come through a further technification. It was very shocking for me to read Kropotkin, uh, Atelier's uh, fabrics and workshops, I don't know how to do, fields and uh, Atelier's and workshops, where he's praising for all the, uh, um, the, the progress and the evolution of agriculture, industrial agriculture in England at the beginning of the century with the greenhouses and so on. Because that said, that would save people from having to work the land. And on the other hand, at the same time, and a little bit before him, there were the Narodniki, the movement of Narodnaya Volia in Russia, that they were saying that actually it's wrong to think that we have to go through the moment of this possession of land, massive exodus of people from the countryside to the, to the cities, as we live now in the European countries, just 2% of the people is living from agriculture, and 15 to 12 people is living in the countryside, percent, and actually still OCDE is using as a criteria of modernization the amount of people living from land. So when Romania entered the European Union, for example, the command was, well, you have to move from that 25, that's a bit undecent number of 25% of population living from farming to a two or five. And that's a progress as well, very well driven through policies and economical policies. Well, the Narodniki said that the, 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 the actually the Ofshina, the, the Mir, the, 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 the peasant community that was resisting under the feudalistic system of the of the of the Tsars uh, was had created a system of mutual support that was a much more uh, uh, let's say promising seed for the uh, hypothetical socialist society than going through the uh, industrial revolution. Um, the Narodniki were intelligentsia from the cities. They spoke mostly French, so they had to learn back Russian when they went to the countryside, and they come massively to the countryside living like what they thought it was a Russian peasant, but they had the folk image. So many of them were seen a bit awkward and they would end up being burned by the villagers because they saw these people coming with this idea of the folk peasant. Um, anyway, the, the moment of uh, reenaction and, and the disconnection of nature is bringing us to a, well, a, a, a kind of possibility of substitution of nature, and this is the other moment we live at, the, 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 the utopia of the biosynthesis, and saying, well, we could move, make even this better, no? or we can make it even more profitable if we have uh, stones with uh, jingles, and, uh, and we can replicate uh, the world, actually, uh, a more adequate way to, 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 to manage land. No? But, um, there are dangers here, and I want just for a second to invoke another word and, the, and another presence to tell us about the, 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 the importance of, of meadows, not meadows, the meadows of the 70s we saw, but meadows in the terms of hay meadows. So I hope there is sound here. We don't know how the sound Well, it's very nice to, to hear at some point. of Europe's traditional hay meadows. This topic has long been a particular interest to me, and I... ...going some way to ensuring their continued role in the future. Now, I, I'm only sorry that I'm unable to be with you in person, uh, and I'm forced instead to appear in this rather disembodied but wonderfully low-carbon form. To 
despite a, a commitment by the European Union and its member states, I'm afraid it is the case that traditionally managed lowland and upland meadows are continuing to decline. In part, this is because many are simply being abandoned. It is also the result of intensification and conversion to pastures for grazing. Well, this is a tragedy on many levels. Not only do these meadows form part of Europe's most spectacular vital biodiversity, they also play a hugely significant role in today's rural economy. These grassland ecosystems support many rural incomes. They are the basis of numerous products from meat, milk, traditional cheeses and honey to herbs, dyes and medicinal plants. And as they enable those commodities to be produced, so our mosaic of hay meadows also provides a range of vital ecological services. Everything uh, from insect pollination, biological pest control and soil formation, to carbon and nitrogen fixing, the cycling of nutrients, uh, and the conservation of water. And above and beyond all of these things, let us not forget that these meadows also comprise an irreplaceable gene bank of grasses, uh, legumes, and other incredibly valuable agricultural and horticultural plants. They are, in the final analysis, profoundly and uniquely beautiful, and as such, an essential balm to what is left of our troubled, disconnected souls. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, these ecological and spiritual benefits are being lost. Farmers are having to abandon their old hay meadows, largely because they demand so much farm labor. The economic squeeze is further exacerbated because sales of the resulting products have to compete with those from large-scale farms with their high inputs of chemical fertilizers and herbicides. So, the big question has to be, how do we strike the right balance between the need for small farms to be viable and able to create healthy economic returns and the great need to maintain these valuable natural resources that provide so many benefits of biodiversity. I recently gave this message to the UNESCO Conference on Landscapes because, for me, this is one of the most pressing concerns for our international leaders, especially in such an uncertain economic climate. All too often, today's much vaunted progress is causing ecosystems to fragment and, in some cases, draw close to collapse. And as they do so, landscapes are destroyed and farming communities that depend upon them are damaged or displaced. Is this what we really want to happen for the long term? Okay. Well, I'll leave this question. Um, um, Again, in this specific moment, you know, what, uh, uh, what we see is uh, a, a very different, as I said, complex of understanding and positioning of what is the, the traditional systems and farming systems. And, um, and it, is, it is funny to see you know, that the, 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 it is as a, as well as a, as a class conflict uh, or a, a class question. And um, the most recent action, I think, it's happening is together with the German reaction in the French case. That is a, a pan-European uh, reaction of shepherds to the imposition of the electronic sheep on sheep. Uh, that is that every sheep should have a sheep to be identified. The sheep is like an egg of this size made of ceramic, uh, covering and then it has to be eaten and swallowed by every sheep it costs 50 60 euros and then you will have to be uh, read by a lector when the veterinary is making the inspections in the farms and if you have any problem with the sheep or the sheep is not in the stomach or the sheep already aborted that is quite common things like that uh, you will be fined so it's a very clear as I said a current uh, example of imposition of power 
biopower no? uh, 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 and biopolitics on uh, small farming. And let's see this present production by the French Shepherd. Will you have noise here? Uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Will you have sound? Yes, fine. On passe beaucoup de temps hein, à observer les bêtes, à regarder. L'élevage industriel, ils disent que tout ce lien, c'est de la sensibilité. Et c'est pas vrai. Depuis le 1er juillet 2010, on est obligé de... Euh, pucer électroniquement toutes les bêtes qui ont plus de 6 mois et qui sont destinées à l'élevage et à l'abattoir. Who understand French here? Can you raise hands? Okay, well, Vincian would make it. More or less, what he's saying is that they have been uh, commanded by the European Union. On ne voit pas pourquoi nous faire remettre des, des puces électroniques. We don't know one we, why we have to identify sheep. Il faut de traçabilité, etc. They say it's a question of traçabilité. Alors ça, c'est le côté des pouvoirs publics. Et après, bien sûr, comme partenaire, ils trouvent des entreprises qui ne demandent que ça. Vendent des puces, vendent des vaccins. Et nous pouvons aussi voir comment ils vont ensemble avec les compagnies qui ont acheté les chiffres. Pour avoir des, des, des brevets avec des boucles électroniques qui vont passer, qui vont faire bip, qui vont s'afficher dans mon ordinateur, etc. Les technocartes de Bruxelles sont en train de nous apprendre comment mener un troupeau. Et ça, on ne va pas se laisser faire parce que bon, notre troupeau, c'est notre vie. Quoi. On peut pas comparer, mais c'est comme les enfants. Quoi. So the young shepherd said that I didn't come back farming to have the sheep identified on the computer. It's, uh, yeah, sorry. C'est la volonté de la contrôle total. Là, c'est pour les bêtes. Well, saying it's the wheel of total control. Now it's for the animals. No, it doesn't work because it's such a... Oh, yeah. Contrôle total, là c'est pour les bêtes. Well, this happens with technology. Um, anyway, just to tell you um, the, the, the moment no, in, in which these different confronting visions are coming together. And on the other hand, as we were looking at yesterday in the workshop on the animals, there is this so there is a strong movement that is rewilding Europe, making Europe a wilder place. Uh, well, this is an evolution of the, let's say, reactionary conservationist movement that thinks that actually what is happening with the displacement of farmer communities is a great opportunity to recover wild land. And it's coming from Netherlands. We find it interesting because Netherlands is like the home of lands, massive landscaping. And uh, it's about, yes, uh, recovering a state of pristine, or com almost pristine nature coming from, uh, from the Neolithic times. So they are bringing, for example, Sajagesa cattle, that is an endangered breed in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Bavarian Peninsula. But it's funny because this breed is, is really being uh, abandoned by farmers because they don't see any benefit on this. And now the rewilding people, they think that it's a very good ancestor of the Auroch and then it's suitable to be interbreed and go back to the wild herbivores that were populating uh, uh, wild Europe long time before. So if you look also at their position, it's like, do you want to bulldoze away houses and farms? Well, not at all, but the fact is that most young people today don't want to be shepherds, gatherers, olive pickers or subsistence farmers anymore. Well, um, this is for me a very wrong understanding of uh, ecology and ecosophy. And I think it's important to bring this to this forum, no? because it's actually where the different forces of opinion are going to play an influence in what countryside we will have now and in the closest future. And this, I said, is uh, quite insane, because at the end, it's a very uh, 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 aristocratic view of a kind of wilderness site, for example, in the middle of the Netherlands, and then all the food being produced, I don't know, uh, either in monocultures in Brazil or in intensive um, dairy farms of thousand heads. So um, there is a there is a, um, a responsibility, you know, we have to take all this. And just well, just to finish, um, and tell you a little bit about the the the, 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 the recent work of this uh, specific project that is about creating a. A movement is called uh, Inland, 
And uh, since uh, 2010, I'm inviting different artists, 22 in total, to work in different villages and start projects there. I could comment some of the projects, for example, while well, Angie Schiffers is working with this uh, exchange of a painting for an audiovisual portrait of the, of, the, of the farmer she works with. And in this case, well, different activities and playing also with electronic sound and traditional music. Uh, this other project by Carmen Cañivano in the Plainlands was interesting because she was focusing at the unit of time needed to cultivate a unit of surface. So it became a six hours documentary on the different moments of the year you need to work with the tractor for one hectare of cereals. Uh, and yeah, it's a reflection on the Marxist uh, economy analysis of time uh, uh, units, but also with the question of um, technification because it took 600. Uh, hours uh, 20 years ago, and now it takes six hours. Um, then, with the money of the grant, she rented one hectare of land, and now it's offered to anyone who wants to grow it there. So, so the work was about bureaucracy and making an answering machine for authorities. This is the project by Emma Smith, a school for tourists in the south of Spain. This is another project by Susana Velasco, a small communal museum. Uh, built in the old stables of the village that actually were abandoned where, where the animals were. So you see the roof is made molding, uh, molding the pieces uh, on the backs of animals. So it's like tiles that shape or take the shape of the animals' backs, you know, as, as, as some reminiscence. But uh, actually this shepherd made this drawing that I find quite good. Uh, well, Antonio Ballesteros have been rethinking the crafts of uh, Canary farmers and uh, Abib Kruglansky and R Bahida Ramujic working with the, uh, how do you say, embroidery, documentary embroidery. So thinking that it's not everything uh, fast uh, as, uh, as documenting with the camera or the video, but also slow. The, the project with Mario Garcia Torres in, uh, in, uh, in um, Malpartida in Cáceres was also interesting because, well, this place where was Vol Vostel, a fluxus artist, end up being in the border with Portugal. And he started to bring, uh, well, uh, for example, a car from uh, Berlin that he just hit into the concrete and was the first car that ever appeared there in the 70s. And it became a fluxus artwork, so I think a bit frustrating for the locals, but anyway. Um, he came to this specific place and he said, wow, nature here is beautiful, it's wonderful, it's so inspiring. We should make art that relates with this specific place and take the site and take art as a new interface with this place and so play, people can uh, enjoy and appreciate the value of this place. So then actually some artwork started to be in the, in the area and then the people started to come. But it was the early 60s and 70s. Let's say that the environmental sensibility was still not as today. So people went there to have the paella, to wash the car, and <laughs> started to be a little bit overcrowded. So at some point uh, the, 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 the artist said, well, it's better to fence this and control the access of people here because otherwise it will be overcrowded and destroyed and spoiled. So what happened is that this land was common land and the shepherds were no longer able to graze there. But there was an art park or a cultural art park. Um, but later as well, the, it was created a natural reserve and the artworks were actually polluting. So they were moved into a specific museum. So it's a story of confusion. No? Well, this story project is about the gastronomy and territory. So it's in the north mountains of Spain and we worked with two artists, Carlos Espada and Maria Monleon, about this specific production system based in a local breed of cow. So the idea was to elaborate the units of landscape through foraging and create a agape, you know, a banquet, uh, as a moment of encountering a food elaboration with the others. So, well, these are the projects. Yeah. And, <laughs> yes, just to finish. Well, just to tell that, I think that, as Jeremy Deller said, is art is maybe not about what we do, but what, what we make, or but what we make to happen. And I think we have to think very much on, uh, not only in the theory that these days we are having a saturation of it, but also in the praxis, and our um, uh, practical application of this uh, references and theoretical reference, not just for a new uh, aesthetical uh, language, a new visual set of references that will be over in a couple of years, but also for, as I said, a, a new uh, um, um, framework uh, for our positioning and, and point of departure with the practice. So the Campo Dentro project is now evolving into a training system 
with uh, with uh, with um, training of artists and arrangement of um, of uh, new settlements in some abandoned villages and marketing of the produce. So this is the last piece. It's a very limited edition of some uh, raw goat cheese with a corporate image of this uh, cow shit. So well, thanks a lot. And anyone interested in joining the the the, the, the project of the either the Shepherd School, the Craft School, or the uh, or the study group that we are starting with uh, with uh, with also with an experimental plot of land in Madrid. Just stay in touch. Thank you. Sorry for being so long. <laughs>